Well, welcome everybody. Hey, welcome to uh, Hope this morning. Uh, fantastic to have you, especially if you're joining us uh, for one of the first times this morning. Uh, my name is Cameron, pastor here, and uh, I am super excited to be beginning this series in Joshua this morning, diving into the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, as I was preparing uh, for Joshua and for today, uh, it reminded me of those words of Paul uh, from Romans. And I'll just bring them up on the screen for you. And, and Paul here writes in Romans, for whatever was written in the past was written for our instructions, so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the Scriptures. Uh, friends, Joshua is written for us. So how about I pray in light of that, and, and we'll dive into Joshua chapter 1. So pray with me. Father, build us in hope that we might have the strength to endure. And build us that we might have all the encouragement you provide through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, you know, I, I think it's so easy, isn't it? If you, you're driving down Camden Valley, Valley Way, it's so easy to think that you are about to enter the promised land. Uh, it's true. Like, does anybody else think that they've, as they're coming into the southwest of Sydney, they're about to enter the promised land? I, I, I think you'd get this idea if you, you just look at the billboards for all the new residential estates as you're driving down Camden Valley Way and the kind of taglines that they have. Have you noticed this as you drive down there? I mean, you're, you're driving down and you see a sign saying, and this is one of them, they're advertising, the place is waiting for you. Not quite that one yet. The place is waiting for you. It's almost like it's, it's been reserved for you. It's, it's been promised to you. Here it is, just come and take it. You drive a bit further, best master planned community. Bit further again, and you'll see this one that we had there on the screen. Why live without? Suggesting that, hey, we're the suburb that's got everything you want. I mean, I mean look at that photo. Doesn't that just speak and shout promised land, doesn't it? It's beautiful. Who, who wouldn't want to live there? And it's often these sort of billboards and signs, you know, they have these themes of, of fulfillment fulfillment and dreams and rest and new beginnings and and I remember and I love seeing the sign for Emerald Hills when it was really just starting and nothing was built there yet they had this big sort of sign Emerald Hills you, you might know it and and uh, it, it was a lovely sort of green color and then right behind what do you see just dirt, brown dirt everywhere. And there's one lone little tree up on the top of a hill. And I'm not sure if that looked like much of the promised land at that point. Uh, in the Bible, the promised land doesn't refer to Sydney's latest land release. But the land that God has promised his chosen people, Israel. And what made that land so special was not the dirt, it wasn't its close proximity to public transport, it wasn't that, it was that God promised it. That's what made it special, God promised it. And there is nowhere that this is seen more clearly than in the book of Joshua. Now you might go here, look, I have no idea how Joshua fits into anything in the Bible, and that's totally okay. We're going to look at this together. But I thought, how about we dive in, or before we dive in, let's have a little bit of a recap of the Bible story so far. And, and dare I say it, you know what, the Bible is a lot like Neighbours. You know the TV show Neighbours? The Bible is a lot like the TV show of Neighbours. In fact, I, I understand that this week is the final episode of Neighbours. Okay, after, well, I was not expecting any fans of Neighbours in the, in the building this morning. There we go. Because, uh, you know, after 37 years, almost 9,000 episodes, Neighbours is finishing up, right? Because it's, it's one big story, and so too with the Bible. The Bible is one big story, true story, made up of lots of little episodes, and it climaxes in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now, let me make this point. That's as much of a comparison I'm making between neighbours and the Bible, okay? But there it is. And in the first episode of the Bible, we call it Genesis, God, he makes the world. Let's have, we're going to have a few little pictures coming up just to help us recap here. God makes the world. He makes it good. He makes the first people. All is good. But then sin enters the world. 
the fall happens. Adam and Eve, they disobey God's word. They reject him and so they boot it out of the garden. Now things continue to keep going downhill as, as mankind spreads, sin spreads as well. But God chooses one man to make a big, big promise to, Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. In fact, I just want to go there right now because Genesis 12, these first few verses are such a key passage, not just for understanding Joshua chapter 1 or Joshua as a whole, but the whole Old Testament, the whole Bible even. So let's have a look at Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, who becomes known as Abraham, go out from your land, your relatives and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. It's a big promise, isn't it? God promises land. He promises a nation, you know, many offspring. He, he promises blessing to them and through them. Land, nation, blessing. And we see this being fulfilled bit by bit. Abraham's descendants... They, they grow in number, but they do end up in Egypt as well. And in fact, because they become so numerous, Pharaoh there enslaves uh, the descendants of Abraham for hundreds of years. But again, God raises up a man. He raises up Moses. And Moses would lead God's people out of Egypt through the Exodus. And God would do these, these uh, wonderful uh, signs and, and, and wonders. And, and then God, he gathers his people out of, out of Egypt in the wilderness at, at Mount Sinai. And there he gives them the law and his commandments. And these are the ways that God's people are to live as his rescued people. But sadly, they break his commands. And so instead of taking a trip that really only should have taken you know, 11 days or so to get to the promised land, it takes them 40 years because of God's judgment upon them. Well, that's a bit of a recap of the first five episodes of the Bible, Genesis through to Deuteronomy, and we come now to episode 6, and that's the book of Joshua. And, and here the nation of Israel... So they're the descendants of, uh, of Abraham. They're now on the edge of the promised land. It's about uh, 1400, 1300 BC. And you can imagine they're on the edge, edge of the promised land. And there's almost as if there's a billboard there, you know, saying, welcome to the promised land. Here's, here's God's master planned community, ready for the taking. They can almost touch it, taste it. They're almost there. But how does the book begin? You may have picked it up. Very first verse of Joshua we're informed Moses is dead. What? Because you read that, that, that's how it begins. Like Moses had been so, so important for the people of Israel for so long. I mean, uh, uh, can you imagine a world where, say, Queen Elizabeth, without Queen Elizabeth, after she has reigned for so long, or maybe even far more significant than that, imagine a world without, say, without neighbours, okay? How would we, it's, it's, it's unimaginable, a world without the Neighbours TV show. Uh, it's, a, it's a TV show that's unparalleled to any other. Well, multiply that by so, 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 so much more, and you have the Israelites trying to imagine a world without Moses. It's, it's completely unimaginable. I mean, it was Moses who had led them all these years. Moses to whom God had spoken directly. It was Moses, when the people kept on screwing up, he mediated for, uh, to God uh, for them. It was Moses who, at the end of the book just beforehand, Deuteronomy, this is what was said about Moses. Have a look at this. No prophet has arisen again in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unparalleled for all the signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do. But now Moses is dead. 
How could they go on? <laughs> what, be strong and courageous? Like, how can they enter the land without Moses being strong and courageous? Well, look, friends, that's not just the power of positive thinking. It's just not like a, a nice little sort of bumper sticker tagline that you might have on your car, right? God has given Joshua and the people of Israel, in fact, us as well, he's given them every reason to be strong and and courageous and the first reason is this because they can trust God's promises now look at verse 2 so keep Joshua chapter 1 in your Bibles or your phone open there we're going to be working through this chapter starting at verse 2 and this is what the Lord says to Joshua Moses my servant is dead now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land I am giving the Israelites. I have given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness and Lebanon to the great Euphrates River, all the land of the Hittites and west to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you, just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or forsake you. Did you hear that? Whatever happens, God's promises still stand. Even if the unimaginable happens, God's promises still stand. And that very promise that was given to Abraham and then was given to Moses is now repeated again to Joshua. Now, who is Joshua here? Well, one of the things that we actually learn about Joshua is, of all the people in the Bible, Joshua is someone who does not have any parents. You know why? He's the son of none. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's, it's in the Scriptures. Oh, sorry, I couldn't help myself there. But okay. far, far more seriously, Joshua... Joshua has been an assistant uh, for, for Moses for many, many years. And in fact, of all the Israelite men who had come out of Egypt 40 years earlier, only Joshua and his buddy Caleb were those who were permitted to enter the promised land because of their faithfulness. Right? In fact, they, they, those two actually wanted to take the promised land years ago, but everyone else was too freaked out. Why? Because they saw the people who were in the land... And they were afraid because they were too strong for them, is the description. That didn't matter to, to Joshua and Caleb. They wanted to go, but no, it didn't happen at that time. And so 40 years later, that whole generation has died out. And now the Lord says to Joshua, okay, <laughs> let's go again. Get ready. Don't you worry about the people in the land. I've got them sorted. You, Joshua, you, verse 6, be strong and courageous. Why? For you will distribute the land that I swore to their fathers, that's the fathers of the people of Israel, to give them as an inheritance. I've promised it. So be strong and courageous. Now, we've been using that phrase a few times now, but what does that actually mean, to be strong and courageous? Does it mean Joshua, got to get some muscles? Can you kind of get, get strong, get juiced up a bit? Is that what it's talking about? Get, get some military might? Is that what it means to be strong and courageous? No, 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 none of that. For Joshua to be strong and courageous is another way of just saying, have faith and trust in the promises of God. I mean, that's what faith is. It's, it's not wishful thinking. No, faith then and faith now is about relying on the reliable promises of God. <laughs> faith is a very concrete thing. So Joshua and, and the people of Israel, they are to be strong and courageous. Why? Knowing that God's promise is to give them that land. But it's not just the promise of land that God makes. God also makes other promises too, like his promise or the promise of his presence. You see there in verse 5. God says, I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or forsake you. And then skip down to verse 9. God continues, haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Why is that? For the Lord your God is with you 
wherever you go. What a wonderful promise to have the Lord your God with you by your side. Wow. Even through all the battles ahead, I am with you. And that's got to put some steel into Joshua's backbone, doesn't it? So Joshua, trust my promises, know my presence. And you can also be strong and courageous, says the Lord, because you will experience my blessing. Look there at verse 7. Above all, the Lord says, be strong and very courageous to do what? To carefully observe the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left, so that you will have success wherever you go. This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to recite it, meditate over it, day and night, so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. So get this right, Joshua is there, the people of Israel are there, they're on the edge of the promised land, and what does Joshua need to do and to know above all else? Is it you know, to get the weapons ready? Is it to have more troops? Is it for Joshua to read Art of War for military strategy? No, 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 it's none of those things. He needs above all else to obey God's word. To obey God's instruction. His commands, his good laws, how they are to live differently as God's people. To trust God's promises. That's what Joshua and the people are to do above all else. And how is he to do that? What's going to help him? Well, the Lord tells him. Joshua is to recite God's word, meditate on it day and night. Joshua is to have a daily Bible reading habit. And it's that constant, careful absorbing of God's word... That will lead him to trust God's promises and to obedience. And if we, like Joshua, are going to trust in the wonderful promises of God, then it makes sense then, doesn't it? That we've we've got to know them. We've got to be reminded of them. We've got to have them on our lips. Because if we don't want to depart from God's path, then we mustn't let God's word depart from our mouths. But uh, obedience to God, it is hard. <laughs> obedience is by nature, I think, is hard, isn't it? I mean, because obedience, it's, it's inconvenience. I mean, love thy neighbor. <laughs> That's inconvenient, isn't it? Obedience can be countercultural. I mean, I, I've always used my body this way. Obedience can be us stopping something, like how a certain way that I use my tongue, it, it might mean me missing out on something because I need to start prioritizing God first. Obedi- obedience can be hard, and Joshua knows that. But he also knows that it's the very God, the God who is calling him to obey, is the very God who has made wonderful promises to him. And if actually, if he chooses to trust and obey, he will experience God's blessing. You see that? God's way brings blessing. God's way brings blessing. And for Joshua, what's that look like? Well, he he will experience the goodness of the land, all that the land has to provide. He will experience that goodness living under God. And he'll also experience the goodness of that deepening relationship with God. There's a wonderful blessing to trusting God and obeying. It's, it's like that old hymn. It might come to mind. Trust and obey. For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. That's the way of blessing. That's the way of happiness. Well, fourthly, one more way Joshua and the people could be strong and courageous. Well, was by how they encouraged one another as God's people. And this is verses 12 to 18. Now, I'm going to show you up on the map here, uh, coming up. Uh, You can see here roughly, follow the, um, ignore all the other colors there and the different tribes, just see the arrows there and the little red tent 
right? This is roughly the, 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 the route that the people of Israel took from the wilderness, coming onto the edge of the promised land, preparing to cross the Jordan River, being the, the, the north, south, up and down uh, river represented there. Now, as they come to prepare to cross the Jordan River, Joshua, what does he do? He addresses uh, two and a half tribes. There's 12 tribes of Israel in total, and he addresses two and a half of them specifically. There are the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now, what's going on there? Why is that? Well, previously, those two and a half tribes had come to Moses and requested land on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And you can now see that there. You can see the, the, the land for the tribe of Reuben and Gad and Manasseh, all on the, the eastern side of the Jordan. Jordan. Now, why was that a bit dodgy of them? Why was that sounding a bit dodgy? Well, because you can see... We'll go back to that slide, thanks, OJ, again. The direction that they've got to come across, all of Israel, is they're going to have to come across, to cross, um, from east to west to cross the Jordan. Now, for those tribes to claim those, that land on the eastern side, that means that they can have all their land, their tribal area, without actually ever needing to cross the Jordan. They don't actually ever need to go and to fight the battles alongside everybody else. They're just leaving all the other tribes to fend for themselves while they're, you know, living it up on the eastern side. And Moses isn't happy with this at all in Numbers chapter 32. He says... Do you realize how incredibly discouraging that would be for all the other tribes? So what do they do? What are these two and a half tribes? There and then they commit to fight alongside their brothers, all the other tribes, when the time came. And so now as Joshua and Israel come to this point on the journey, Joshua reminds them, hey guys, remember what you committed to. Are you going to stick with it? And they, they do. They, they say, yes, you fight, our fighting men, they will come across. They will join the fight until all of Israel has been given the land God promised them. Now, have a look at verse 16. This is how they answer Joshua. Everything you have commanded us, we will do. And everywhere you send us, we will go. We will obey you just as we obeyed Moses in everything. And may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. This is them echoing it back to him, to Joshua. Anyone who rebels against your order and does not obey your words in all that you command him will be put to death. Okay, they're serious about this, aren't they? Above all, be strong and courageous. They're saying this back to Joshua. They're saying, we're with you. We're in this together. And that is encouraging, isn't it? It builds strength, it builds courage for the people because they know that they're about to enter the land united as one, as God's people. So that's Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and courageous. But you know, still, is that a slogan, so to speak, for us as well? We saw it coming up time and time again in Joshua chapter 1, is, but is it for us? Because if it's not, then there's a whole industry of Christian merchandise and bumper stickers that we've got to throw out the window, don't we? I mean, we are not Joshua. We are not the next divinely appointed leader of God's Old Testament people. We are not called to conquer a foreign land, even if you think God has promised you New Zealand. No, 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 don't, don't go for that. This was for a particular people at a particular place in a particular time in the unfolding plan of God. But remember that the Bible is one big story, just like neighbours. And that it finds its climax in the person and work of Jesus, unlike neighbours. And it's in Jesus that we can know the fulfilment of God's promises. And the fulfillment of God's presence. And the fulfillment of his blessing and his people. And, and I just want to track through just each of those things just for a little bit now uh, as we uh, are finishing up. So firstly, what do we see there? Trusting in God's promises in Jesus. And we can read this, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. For every one of God's promises is yes in him, in Jesus. 
The promises that God made to Abraham, that of land, of nation, of blessing, they are ultimately all fulfilled in Jesus. And Israel, in Joshua's day, Israel entering that land was just one small step along the way towards what Jesus would fulfill ultimately. And so if you, are, if you trust in Jesus, if your faith is in Jesus, then we are called up in the fulfillment of those promises by faith. For in Jesus, we don't look for a patch of dirt in the Middle East. We don't even look for a patch of dirt in the Southwest either. <laughs> we look for a heavenly place, a heavenly inheritance. And it's one that we don't even need to fight for. Why is that? Because Jesus has already fought for us on the cross. So to this we can say, oh church, be strong and courageous. For all of God's promises are fulfilled in Jesus. But what about the promise of God's presence? Well, God does say to Joshua time and time again, uh, throughout this book of Joshua, he says, I am with you always. I mean, to have the God who rules everything, to have that God with you and make such a personal promise to you. I mean, can you imagine? But this is the thing we don't need to imagine. Because what does the risen Jesus say in Matthew 28? Look at this one. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. That rings a bell. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. O church, be strong and courageous. The risen Lord Jesus, he is the Lord of all and he is with you no matter what battles lie ahead and no matter where you are. But what does it look like to experience God's blessing in Jesus? I mean, Joshua, well, he, he was promised the blessing of prosperity in the land. Is that for us too? Are we to expect that kind of physical blessing of the Lamborghini and the latest land release in Leppington? No, not quite. Well, no, well, quite the opposite, really. If anything, what God promises, it's, well, suffering. <laughs> Look at 2 Timothy. In fact, all those who want to live a godly life, an obedient life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And where's the blessing there for God's people? Rather, God promises prosperity in terms of spiritual blessings. What does Ephesians chapter 1 say? Look at verse 3. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. And I love just to read that whole chapter. Go home and read Ephesians chapter 1 later on. Uh, we don't have time now, but what do we see again and again? In Christ, we have been chosen in Him. In Christ, we have been predestined and adopted and redeemed and received an inheritance and received His Holy Spirit sealed uh, in us as a guaranteed. Oh, church, we can be strong and courageous because you have every spiritual blessing in the heavens. And that's not because of you. That's because of Christ and what He's done. And finally, we can encourage God's people in Jesus because Jesus has brought us together. Uh, listen to Hebrews chapter 10. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our worship meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other. And all the more, as you see, the day drawing near. Do you see that? That as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are to be courage builders of one another. I'm not sure, have you thought about yourself in that way before? You are a courage builder. You are a courage builder of everyone around here. As we come to meet as one, we build courage in one another. 
Every time that we say we're in this together and we live that out, we build courage in each other. Every time we point each other to Jesus and the promise of his return, we build courage in each other. You are a courage builder of the person next to you and the person next to them and the person in your hope group. We are courage builders. O oh, church, be strong and courageous because God has given you this people to encourage you. Be strong and courageous, Hope Heart. Let's pray. Our God Almighty, we thank you that you are the God who has made promises and that you keep them. And we thank you for your word, your, your scriptures, which teach us and remind us and reveal to us your unfolding plan of what you are doing and how they all come to this wonderful climax in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he has done at the cross in his resurrection and in his return to bring us home to the land you have provided, that heavenly inheritance, that eternal rest. And Father, as we set our eyes on you and your promises and your son and we do that together as one, Please instill in us a strength and encourage and help us to do that for one another as we continue to, to fight the good fight and to run the race. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.